gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very thankful for everything that is ours in Christ Jesus. I just pray that you would open our eyes to see just what you have accomplished on our behalf. I ask that you would filter out all that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts the truth of your word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. First off, I just want to say that uh, no matter how we look at uh, end times prophecy, I believe that we are running out of time. And no matter how excited or exhilarated that we are about our Lord's near return for his church, the truth of God's word during this present time can be just just as if not more exciting when we look at what Christ has done for us we're going through the epistle to Philemon verse by verse so I thank you for joining us and in our last study together we had reached the fifth and the sixth verses of Philemon. You'll remember the essential facts that Onesimus was Philemon's slave, and as a slave, he had no rights whatsoever. And included in those rights was any right to run away and any right to wrong his master. Apparently, he had done both of these. If we read this epistle correctly, we can assume that the Holy Spirit led him to Paul and Paul to him. He came to know the Lord and Paul is now sending him back to his master with this letter. When Adam sinned, he fled from God and it was God who sought Adam. And you'll remember that through Adam and Eve, we became alienated from God. Adam and Eve tried to clothe themselves with their guilt or from their guilt with uh, fig leaves. God killed an animal and made clothing for them from the skins of, of that animal. I have no doubt whatsoever that Adam sinned, uh, that Adam and Eve tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves and that God Almighty did in fact kill an animal, uh, shed its blood and make clothes for them out of the hides of that animal. I have no doubt about that at all. But, but there is... a. Uh, there is a far, far more uh, deeper meaning than that which appears on the surface. Because of Adam's sin, the innocent, innocent must die. One who had no part in Adam's transgression, nothing to do with it, and yet that innocent one had to give its life so that Adam might be clothed from his shame. When we look at Abraham, Abraham called his servant to him and told him to go find a wife for Isaac. I have no doubts that Abraham lived and that Abraham called his servant and told him that he wanted him to go back to his family and, and get a bride for his son so that his son didn't marry outside the clan. I believe that that actually happened, but there's a vastly more important meaning in the story that God Almighty sent forth the Holy Spirit to get a bride for his son. When we read uh, that Joseph was sold by his brethren into Egypt, I have no doubts but that Joseph was sold into Egypt, but to the one with spiritual eyes, we see him as a type of Christ in the deliverance of his own people. I have no doubt that, no doubts whatsoever that Moses lived and that he made a tabernacle exactly as it was shown him, and that in that 
tabernacle. He placed an ark that was made out of wood and overlaid with gold and had in it only the word of God. I have no doubts that those things actually happened. But I suggest that with our spiritual eyes, we see an intense picture of the incarnation and the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ as the word of God, our redeemer. You'll remember that Christ went to a wedding. He changed water into wine. I believe he did that. I believe there was a wedding that was in Cana of Galilee, that there was a girl and a boy who got married and somebody who officiated that wedding. But again, I believe if we open our spiritual eyes, there's a beautiful picture that we have been brought into a union with Christ that is as intense and as intimate as a marriage. And then we read that there was a nobleman who made intercession for his son and his son was healed. I believe that there was a noble man and I believe he had a boy. I believe that boy was sick and I believe that that boy was healed. But again, there is the beautiful picture of God and his concern for me. And it's separate from anything that I did. The Lord Jesus Christ interceded for me and I was healed. Let's not forget about the impotent man by the pool of Bethesda. He didn't seek Christ. Christ sought him. In fact, we're told that there was a certain man, the text says a certain man, by the pool. There were many people by the pool. Why didn't he heal them all? He was God Almighty, but he, he came to one man who had been there for 38 years some angel comes down, troubles the water, and the first one in is healed. You know, that's the way that paganism is. It's the way paganism always is. First one in, one that can pay the most. You know, wanting, you want to get your relatives out of purgatory, you're able to pay more than the next family, you'll get them out quicker. Paganism always works that way, but Christ sought him out, touched him, and healed him. And again, I have no doubt there was a pool there, and there was a man there that was sick, and he had been sick for 38 years. And I have no doubts that Christ touched him and healed him, but I also believe, dearly beloved, that there is a vast message for those of us who, knew, who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ that also we were trusting in tradition, in fiction, in foolishness, but Christ sought us out. He touched us and he healed us. I read about 5,000 people who were hungry. They had no means to feed themselves and Christ touched a small portion. He made it sufficient for all of them. And I see that we're hungry, unable to feed ourselves and that the word of God provides more than enough spiritual food for our every need. I read about the disciples on a boat in a storm-tossed sea, unable to row, unable to move, unable to get to their destination, and Christ comes walking on the waters. He smooths them, and he immediately they're where they wanted to go. I have no doubts that that happened. But there was an actual, that there was an actual storm, that an actual lake, an actual boat. But oh, how I rejoice in the message that I was on that troubled sea unable to move toward my destination, absolutely impossible to help myself. And Christ comes and he steals the water. And I was where I was meant to be. There was a man born blind from birth. He didn't see Christ. He didn't ask for sight. Christ sought him, touched him, gave him sight, didn't even know who Christ was. And again, I have no doubts that that happened. But I believe that there is a vast meaning there that I was blind. And in that condition, Christ sought me out and he gave me sight. 
Last of all, I see Lazarus dead and Christ saying, Lazarus, come forth. I have no doubts Lazarus lived. I have no doubts that he died. And I'm persuaded, whether many are or not, makes no difference. I'm absolutely persuaded that when Christ said, Lazarus, come forth, he came forth. But I believe there's a much greater meaning there that I also was dead. Being dead, I was unable to remedy my lost condition. I wasn't seeking God. I wasn't working for God. I wasn't asking for life. And he called me by name. He knew my name. He branded my name on the palms of his hands. He called me forth and and I now come to Philemon. I have no doubts that Philemon was a businessman in the city of Colossae. I have no doubt in my mind that he was a man of some substance and wealth, that he had servants, probably many, many servants, one of whom was Onesimus. And I am persuaded because I love the Lord and I believe this to be the inspired word of God that Onesimus ran away and probably when he ran away, he took what was necessary for his trip. So he actually robbed his master as well as fleeing from him. I have no doubts that the Holy Spirit touched Onesimus. As we've seen in all of the rest of Scripture, God brought him to Paul and through Paul opened his eyes to the realization that he belonged to God. He, he was a certain man. He may have been blind and impotent and dead, but he was God's. And now in his redeemed condition, the Apostle Paul has suggested that the right thing to do is to go back to Philemon. Back to Philemon. And the only thing that Onesimus can anticipate correctly is death. He has no rights as a runaway slave. He has no way to remedy his condition. And I have no doubt that Paul lived, that Paul was in prison in Rome, that he met Onesimus, no doubts at all surrounding the facts of this letter. But I believe that there is an intense spiritual message here for us in this. We reached the fifth verse in our last study, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, and I suggested that what I saw in this was the Lord Jesus Christ saying that all he hears and all he sees is your love and your faithfulness. I'm in no way suggesting that God is not sovereign and that God is not omniscient. I'm certain that there isn't anything that God doesn't know about your life and mine. But what I hear in this message is that what God sees is faithfulness in love. Concerning sin, I have no doubt that sin's real, but there is also no doubt in my mind that the new creation does not sin. Romans 7. Therefore it is not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Isn't the Holy Spirit going out of His way to tell you and me that sin is no longer the problem? That as a new creation in Christ Jesus, that we stand before him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. I stress this because most of the Christians that I meet seem to think that God's up there eagerly keeping records of all the naughty things that you do and that someday you'll face this fantastic record, this, this computer database with all of your infractions of God's law. When God has stumbled over himself to say to you and me that we're not under law, but we're under grace. Where no law is, there is no transgression. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin because his seed abideth in him and he has no power to sin so that we can understand a bit more of, of what the Holy Spirit was saying through Paul, it is not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. 
Dearly beloved, I have never once in the seven years of this ministry suggested to you that sin doesn't dwell in you. It does, and it operates quite finely. But by the grace of God in looking at you through the substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he sees your love and your faithfulness. In order that, verse 6, the communication of thy faithfulness may be effectual by acknowledging by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Folks, if you don't see God's word as positive reinforcement, then you, you're not looking at it hard enough. What is God saying to us here? That if you are to enter into this communion of fellowship that is yours, you need, you must acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I mean, what, what, what did God do? Did, did he just, uh, did, he, did he only put some of, of Christ in some people and, and more of Christ in another? And, and, and well, he put all of him in Paul? Is, is, that, is that what happened? Or has God made a sufficient sacrifice for you and I? The great problem in the Christian community is not trying to whitewash the old man, but to get Christians to understand what God has done for them in Christ. If the communication, if the fellowship of that faithfulness is to be effectual, it is based not upon man's production, not upon his good works, but upon the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. No wonder this little epistle is such a, a jewel, a gem. For years, I have suggested to you folks that I believe the translation of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is properly that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, created upon good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Them. Those are the good works of Jesus Christ. There are so many Christians who have tried to base their life upon their performance, their dedication, their surrender, and their works. They wind up despondent. They wind up frustrated. Dearly beloved, listen to me. You need to acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Is God handling, is he just handling this text loosely when he says that in Christ he presents us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight, that we stand before him without fault and without blemish? I see in the fifth verse and the sixth verse the same as I see in Lot when God says it vexed Lot's righteous soul. Now, I wouldn't have called Lot very righteous had it been, you know, to me to judge, but God calls him righteous because he is. He was made righteous in Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin was made sin for you that you might be made the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, folks, I recognize that the word might is a subjunctive mood and Christians build so much on that subjunctive mood. Listen, it is a purpose clause. And a point of Greek grammar is that in a purpose clause, the subjunctive mood is the correct construction. The construction does not say he made it possible for you to be righteous. The construction says that he made you righteous because your unrighteousness was placed on Christ. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the hearts of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. That's what I see God Almighty saying about us. Not just Philemon, but about us. And I see in this epistle a picture of the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ in interceding for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I believe the Holy Spirit is appealing to the heart of Philemon based upon what Christ has done. 
I believe the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf begins with his finished work. I don't, I don't so much see Paul writing a letter uh, to appeal to the feelings of sympathy in the heart of Philemon as I see the Lord Jesus Christ bringing me before the throne of the majestic sovereign of eternity and the basis of his appeal is mediation, his finished work. You know, the older I get, the more convinced I become that most Christians do not enter into the finished work of Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, it is finished. I see the Lord Jesus Christ presenting his work before God Almighty, not my works, but his. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Why the yea, rather, that is risen again? Because it emphasizes the sufficiency of his death. He did everything that needs to be done for your redemption. And the Lord Jesus Christ bases his mediation upon his finished work. Verse 9, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I am, I am now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He belongs to Jesus Christ. And that speaks to me of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That speaks of Christ who sits at the right hand of, the, of, of God on high, He's completed his work and his present position is a position at the right hand of God. And so he can appeal not only on the basis of his finished work, but on his present position before God. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Verse 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. That is a term, folks, of endearment. I don't suppose that Paul in his prison cell went through any legal process of adoption. So what am I to see here? Our close relationship to Christ. Therefore, he's not ashamed to call me brother. The Lord Jesus Christ cannot only call me brother, he can call me son, so close is the relationship. For I was born again through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The slave with no rights, no money, no hope, his only prospect, judgment, and death. My son, Onesimus. Amazing. And I see the Lord Jesus Christ in his mediation bringing before God Almighty his finished work on my behalf, his present position of glorification on high at the right hand of the Father and the fact that I am so closely related to him that he calls me son, that he calls me brother, not because there was anything in me that merited that. Dearly beloved, your eyes are far from the understanding of God's grace if in the white spaces you paint Onesimus as is a handsome young man whose heartfelt desire was to do right, and he knows that somehow he made a mistake, and if only he could correct it. Ah, come on, come on. In Onesimus, you see a condemned sinner whose only prospect is judgment and death. And now, and now, he is so close to God the relationship of father and son is used. No wonder we're called sons of God and children of God and brothers of Christ whom, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Wouldn't that speak to you of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it possible for us as humans to somehow enter into what it must have been for the God of all eternity, the God of creation to become incarnate in human flesh and yet there is no other possible redemption Angels could not have redeemed me. I needed a kinsman redeemer and the God of eternity became God incarnate in time. No prison cell could compare to what bound the Lord Jesus Christ in the incarnation. 
And I see in the 10th verse that I'm born again because of Jesus Christ, whom I have begotten in my bonds because Jesus Christ became incarnate in human flesh and thereby became my kinsman redeemer. Had that not been possible, I couldn't have been born. My relationship to God and my position in this mediation is based upon the fact, the solid fact that God did it right. He didn't wink at sin. He became incarnate in human flesh, thereby becoming my kinsman, thus being able to pay the price that purchased my redemption. He is my kinsman redeemer. Verse 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now is profitable both to you and to me. I believe that's grace. That by God's grace, you have been made so righteous that you are profitable to God. You, you were absolutely unprofitable. D don't minimize the word worthless. And, and now precious. Now, dearly beloved, did you become precious because of something that you did? And I don't think we even need to dwell on that fact. You know that that is not true. You were not working for God. You were not seeking God. You were not living for God. And in that condition, you were absolutely unable to please the Almighty God. Romans 8, 7, and 8, But through grace we who were worthless are made precious. Oh, what a marvelous, marvelous revelation of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You wouldn't think you would find that in this little tiny book of Philemon. But it, it is a golden thread that runs all throughout the Word of God. Not made precious because of the way that we live or what we do. And, and folks, I don't intend in any way to minimize Christian responsibility and Christian service. But until we maximize what God has done for us in Christ, that by the grace of God, we become precious, not by performance, not by production, but by His grace, we become precious. We'll never enter into all of that which is ours in Christ Jesus. Once I understand that, can't He do with me as He pleases? Isn't this really the basis of the comfort that God's, God holds out to us? How would, I, how would I ever know that He has really worked in me a work of grace if it isn't put to the test? How could I ever really know that I trust Him, that I love Him, that I live for Him, or anything else? There are so, so many people who are led to believe that the only thing that counts is what they do for Christ. And thereby, they have greatly minimized what Christ has done for them. I know that I was worthless. And now that I'm worth something to God, the question has to come in the 11th verse. How much am I worth? The life of His Son. An infinite price paid on my behalf. The life of God's Son. Now I'm sure that Onesimus became aware of his sonship under Paul's tutelage. I, I believe he became aware of the fact that he belonged to Christ, whereas before he didn't seem to realize that. And now under Paul's ministry, he becomes aware of that, that he is God's son, and that changes the entire relationship. I believe that Paul was the tool that God used to open Onesimus' eyes and that it changed the relationship between both Onesimus and Philemon. But that it not only changed the relationship between Onesimus and God, but between Onesimus and Philemon. They now become brothers in Christ Jesus. Dearly beloved, I want you to go away from this message, rejoicing in these passages of Scripture, to understand what God has done for you, completely done for you, in Christ Jesus. In a very real sense, we were all, every one of us, Onesimus.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity we've had to think about it. May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. May our eyes be open to the marvelous truth of our position in him, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for watching, for listening. We here at Blessed Hope Forever, we pray for you constantly. Please pray for us in the direction of this ministry. We are so anxiously awaiting his return, but dearly beloved, don't forget about the present. Until next time, rest in him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.